in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Whoever believes in me, though they die, will live. Today, the fifth Sunday in Lent, is often called Passion Sunday, as it marks the liturgical stage when we turn our attention more particularly to the commemoration of our Lord's suffering and death. It might seem a little strange, therefore, that two of our lessons this morning should appear to be concerned with raising from the dead when there are still two weeks to Easter. But we can see an underlying theme, I think, in all three lessons, God's power to bring new life out of nothingness. In contrast to ancient creation myths, in which a divine being creates out of some form of chaos, here, we might say, is the Christian understanding of God's nature and purpose as revealed in his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ezekiel's vision, the desiccated condition of the bones represents Israel in its hopeless condition after the Babylonian conquest. Some Israelites were living in the occupied ancestral land with Jerusalem and other cities destroyed. Others were exiles in a strange land, wondering if they would ever return. And there would also be memories of people slain during the Babylonian invasion. In the vision, the bones are brought together with sinews and skin, but still lifeless. Then at God's command, Ezekiel prophesies to the breath, speaks the word of God over the breath, which enters the bodies and the bodies stand alive before him. Now the same word in Hebrew denotes both breath and wind. So the refreshing and powerful wind is God's breath or spirit, which not only restores the life of the people, but enables them to respond to him in faithfulness. There is new life beyond despair as the gift of God's spirit recreates his people Israel. And St. Paul, writing to the Romans, talks of God's spirit giving life to our mortal bodies by his indwelling spirit, just as in Ezekiel's vision, the wind, the breath of God, gave life to the reconstructed bodies. We have to do a bit of decoding when we read St. Paul. The word flesh is often understood negatively as inherently evil, but flesh is part of how God created us. In Romans, Paul uses flesh to denote natural instincts perverted to sin's cause. And body in this context means the whole individuality of oneself, mortal but capable of receiving immortality. The mindset of the flesh is death, says St. Paul, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. And we are given the spirit because Christ dwells in us through our baptism which grafts us into Christ. And Paul goes on to say in this morning's lesson that through the spirit, our mortal bodies, our mortal selves, will be vivified by God who raised Christ from the dead. We are alive to God in Jesus Christ. So now we turn to the gospel reading from St. John. First of all, we must remind ourselves that in this gospel, the teaching of Jesus is expressed in a series of signs, beginning with the marriage in Cana of Galilee and the turning of the water into wine. And other signs are the conversation with the Samaritan woman in Jacob's well and the healing of the man born blind. In each case, Jesus discloses himself as the expected Messiah to people who are searching but may not even know they are, a situation that we've probably all been in at some time or other. The woman at the well confesses her faith after conversation with Jesus, who himself declares that those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. And the man born blind confesses his faith in who Jesus is, and Jesus declares, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see. 
These stories are parables of coming to or growing in faith. Jesus makes himself known, he works a sign, but that is not enough for everyone. There is always division, for not all are convinced, but some do believe. As it says at the end of today's gospel, some of the Jews believed, for faith cannot be dragooned. The story of the raising of Lazarus is the final sign in John's account of the ministry of Jesus before the ultimate great sign of his crucifixion. Jesus had left Judea to avoid arrest, the underlying idea being that his hour had not yet come. But when he gets the news of Lazarus' death, he decides to return to Judea. He whom you love is dead. As always with John's Gospel, there is more than one level here. Lazarus is portrayed as Jesus' friend, but at another level, everyone is Jesus' friend. Our Lord's deliberate delay of two days takes him beyond the third day to the amazement of the disciples. But the whole situation is for the glory of God and to glorify the Son through it, Jesus says. And we're reminded of the Lord's reply to the disciples' question about the man born blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents? The glory of God is manifested in what Jesus, obedient to his Father, does even in adverse circumstances. Even so, despite what Jesus says, his disciples urge him not to go back to Judea. They're also shown as not understanding the Lord's remark that Lazarus has fallen asleep and that he will awaken him. Obtuse disciples or interlocutors are a persistent theme in John, but Jesus has set his face for his father has sent him. In bewilderment, the disciples will follow and it is the later doubting Thomas himself who says, let us go that we may die with him. In all the gospels, we find the bewildered or amazed disciples perhaps not knowing what they are letting themselves in for, but still wanting to be with Jesus. And then, as with the earlier signs, there is a disclosure by the Lord. When Martha expresses her belief in the dead rising at the last day, a belief held by many, but not all Jews of the time, Jesus utters another, I am saying, possibly the greatest in the gospel, I am the resurrection. I am life. It is here, now, not future indefinite. And Martha responds by confessing her belief in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Resurrection is no longer a concept, it is incarnated. And we're next told that Jesus became angry and troubled, and then that he wept. Many find this puzzling. Yet the evangelist does not ask us to see the incarnate Lord as one who is immune to human reactions and feelings, but why these reactions? At the ordinary human level, Jesus has lost a friend, and he is encountering the corruption and darkness of death that we all experience in such circumstances. But as usual in this gospel, there is another level, the encounter with unbelief all around him, which means that whatever signs he works at the will of his heavenly Father, there will be scoffers and God's loving kindness will be frustrated. In the account of the suffering and death of our Lord given in St. John's Gospel, nowhere does Jesus groan or sweat or tremble and he even carries his own cross. He is simply shown as completing the work of the one who sent him, his Father, and his last word will be, it is accomplished. His emotions are instead expressed in this story of the raising of Lazarus. He is angry at the power of death, angry by anticipation with those who will not accept the good news he has been enacting, but instead go off and denounce him to the Sanhedrin, angry too at the corruption and darkness of death, which stand for what opposes God's purposes. This final sign begins the chain of events that lead to the death of Jesus on the cross, coming back 
to Judea, he has put himself in jeopardy on the level of authorities wanting to get rid of him. But the, at the level of divine activity, as a result of his self-revelation as Lord of life and death, Jesus will die. And he has laid down his life for his friend, for Lazarus, for all mankind. Take away the stone, unbind him, and let him go. Behold how he loved him. That is what the resurrection means in our Christian belief, the possibility of recovery from all negativity through the power of God. And this last sign before the Lord's passion and death already hints at the price of the love of God in Christ Jesus, who came the price of humankind to pay and spoil the spoiler of his prey. For whoever believes in me, though they die, will live. May we be strengthened in this faith, this passion tide. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.